Okay. Let's just make sure there's nobody else waiting to get in. Okay, so we're up to 18 people, so I guess we'll we'll get started. Um, so just a couple things. Um, I'm sure that Pete distributed out today, but the, the region and the state put out another guidance document, which basically is saying now that the hospitals are going broke. They're not really saying that in the document, but the truth is that the... Um, the hospitals are going broke because they're not seeing enough patients. So they want us now to be transporting everybody who wants to go to the hospital to the hospital. So what they were telling us before about, you know, um, uh, I guess selective uh, screening of people who were otherwise stable and didn't need to be transported that we should do. Now they're saying that we should not do that anymore and that anybody who wants to go to the hospital should go to the hospital. And um, I don't know if you've been to the hospital the last two days, but the emergency rooms are empty and um, the hospitals are in panic mode. And um, you know they feel they have tons of capacity and that anybody who wants to go to the hospital should be allowed to uh, go to the hospital. So that's you know the, the latest and the greatest. Whether that's going to change or not change, I don't know, but that is the... Uh, you know, the latest from the hospital. So I'm just trying to see if I can fix something here, but no, I can't fix it. Okay, we'll figure it out. Okay, so does anybody have any questions on anything before we start the actual presentation? Okay. So it's gonna be pretty much the same as the last time, which is we'll do a, a little presentation tonight at pick neonatal resuscitation. Um, after it's done, um, I will email out a link um, to Pete, to send to all of you, which would be a link to the exam that you'll take, a 10 question little quiz. And you need to get a 70 or better on the quiz. You'll have uh, two or three, I think it's three, three attempts to get a 70 or better. If you do get a 70 or better on the quiz, it emails you and me a completion. Um, oh, hold on, we got to figure out. I can't find the mute here. Um, I can't get to the button that says mute all. Hmm. Hey, Frank, I got a quick question for you. Yes. The, the CPR um, standards, the protocols, which were taken back, are there any changes from the original CPR protocol from the beginning of the year? What do you, um, what do you mean? So, um, uh, three weeks ago, we were told unless, you know, we transporting to the hospital, if we get a rhythm back. I tell you, hold on for a second. I'm going to mute everyone and then I'll just find you and I'll mute you. Hold on one second because it's getting noisy. Pete, you there? It's Wayne. Oh. Who was asking? Wayne? Yeah. Okay. So remember, so they came out with the new CPR protocols, then it was rescinded. Did anything change at all from what was rescinded? So we're, we're going back to pre-COVID um, as far as, are you talking termination? Yeah. Termination of efforts? So we're going back to pre-COVID. They put something out today, but they need to change it because in what they put out today, it says both adult and pediatric. And in the protocol, it says that the protocol pertains to people over 18 years of age. So um, the, the, the guidance will be for adult patients over 18 years of age. And it's what's always there. You know, it had to be, um, it couldn't have been a witnessed arrest. They could not have had a shock provided, whether it be by the police or us. Um, I'm trying to think what else it was. Um, well, actually, I could, I probably could bring it up. Give me a second. Let me see if I have it. Or Frank, I know you said it was just changed today. Could you, whenever you get it, could you just email it to Peter and he could send it out to everybody? Yeah, well, what, what was, I mean, I guess what was changed was it, all they're saying is that it went back to what it was previously. Like right, pre so that, that part I knew. Right. So I just can't minimize the screen when I'm in here, um, but I'm pretty sure I have it saved on my desktop. Hold on one second. Let me just see. If I have it here. Uh, okay, hold on, I could do it this way.
Just give me one second, I'll have it up. Not what I wanted. Um, my screen sharing is paused. Hold on one second. Okay. Okay, can you see the cardiac arrest protocol on your screen? Yes? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, so this is the, you know, the regular um, BLS protocol cardiac arrest. So, you know, this is everything we always did, CPR and everything like that. So now I'm going to go to the termination of efforts, okay? So after 20 minutes, consider calling medical control for ter termination, resuscitation, continuing efforts, or transportation in extenuating circumstances. So in other words, after 20 minutes, a cardiac arrest that's worked in the field and does not come back with what they call ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation, usually does not um, survive. So that what they're saying there is that after 20 minutes, you could, you know, call for permission to terminate, okay? Um, you could call for permission to continue, or you could call for permission to transport that patient that's still in cardiac arrest. So, you know, that's, that's kind of where they're at. So in other words, they're saying, I guess in a convoluted way is that we should not be transporting those patients, right? Because we have to call for permission to transport those patients if they're still in cardiac arrest after 20 minutes of being worked. But let me go to the other one. Um, and then, you know, I, I passed it, but they have this whole thing about, you know, compressions and moving ambulance pose significant danger providers are less effective and should be avoided. So, you know, you have the Lucas, but that's another way of their saying that, you know, if you don't have mechanical CPR, really patients shouldn't be transported at all because of the danger. Okay, so let me go to... Okay, so the first one obvious, just real quick to review obvious death. So what this means that you don't have to work the patient at all, right? So you don't even consider working the patient. So first is if they have an advanced directive, Okay, so if there's any advanced directive, a DNR or most form, um, you do not have to work the patient. Remember, they're always considered valid um, unless for some reason you have suspicion. So even if they're 10 years old, they're considered valid. Even if it's a copy, they're considered valid. Um, if the family is trying to rescind the advanced directive, then you should call medical control because a family member technically could rescind it, but medical control would try to talk them out of it by trying to explain that, you know, their family's wishes was not to have anything done. And now in this, you know, moment of panic, you're, you know, going against your uh, family's wishes. So any kind of advanced directive. And remember in the field, we can only honor out of hospital, do not resuscitate orders. And the most form, which is called medical orders for life sustaining treatment. Emost means it's just an electronic version of it. So we don't, you know, you're not going to see that unless you're, I don't know, maybe in a, a group home setting or some kind of place where they have a electronic medical records, you know, so that would be considered uh, acceptable also. Now, if a patient comes home from the hospital with an in-hospital DNR, that in-hospital DNR only covers them during the transport. So once they're home, they have to have an out-of-hospital uh, DNR. 
So the, you know, again, if they left the hospital with an in-hospital DNR, that's okay for the transport ambulance, but it doesn't help you once you get there on a 911 job. Then the other reason, you know, you would not start resuscitation is any signs of obvious death. So the earliest sign we know is dependent lividity, which means the part of the body that's closest to the ground. So if they're laying on the back, it would be their back gets a purplish discolorization, typically 15 to 30 minutes after blood flow ceases. Um, the parts that are touching have pressure, like the, say the shoulders or the buttocks, you know, if they're laying on their back, usually don't have that discolorization. So it'd be kind of the small of their back would have it, under their thighs would have it. Um, and that's the first thing you should always do on every code that's not witnessed is roll the patient and see if there's any signs of dependent lividity. If there are, you do not work that patient because they've been down way too long and there's no chance of bringing them back. The next step would be rigor mortis. Again, depending on the temperature, age, health of the patient, you know, you're probably looking somewhere, you know, 30 minutes to an hour before things start tightening up, maybe even longer. And you all know that the first place you see it is the jaw, right? So either they're gonna die with their mouth open and you can't close it, or they die with their mouth closed and you can't open it. Okay. And then obviously, if the body's decomposing, everybody knows, you know, we won't be doing anything. Or if there's a uh, fatal injury, you know, a decapitation or something like that, you would not be doing it. The other thing they put in here is if you had a drowning, if the patient's been submerged for greater than one hour, it becomes a, a body recovery, um, not a resuscitation at that point. Okay, so that's the obvious death. And then the other thing I think Wayne was asking about, um, it's going to be in here somewhere. Actually, before we go to that, this is one thing um, just to talk about. They, this is a new protocol they put in here, the, the apparent life-threatening event and the brief unresolved unexplained events. This is for PEDS patients under two years of age. So you've all gone in these calls. These are the call where the parents say the child was seizing or the child stopped breathing or the child turned blue. And a lot of times we you know, attribute it to a febrile seizure, which a lot of times it is. Okay, but now in the pediatric emergency medicine world, they have these two, um, I don't wanna say conditions, but two, two possibilities to consider. So they don't want us to just kind of poo-poo it like we used to do in the past and say it's a febrile seizure and the kid's gonna be fine and you know, give them some Tylenol, keep them cool and stuff like that. So they really feel that these are near misses and that these child should be transported to the hospital. Now, a hospital for this type of thing personally would be a pediatric capable hospital. So we don't have that in Rockland County. Um, that would be, you know, Westchester, um, Hackensack would be the, probably two pediatric, true pediatric hospitals that have, you know, pediatric emergency medicine physicians on and pediatric intensive care units and stuff like that. So that's kind of what they're talking about there. And a lot of times we get there, these patients look fine. You know, it's the parents that look more scared than the, the patients do, but they consider that to be kind of near misses now and they want um, those patients to be evaluated by people who actually have expertise. And I can't find that. I have to go back to the index in a second. Hold on for a second. Let me just go back to the index. Oops. Okay, so the reason I can't find it is it's not in the BLS protocol. It's only in the ALS protocol. So I guess what your version of it would be, hold on a second. Your version would be the one we were looking at over here. So your version is contained in this one. Okay. So here's your, under EMT, your termination things. After 20 minutes, consider calling medical control for termination or resuscitation. Continue efforts or transportation extenuating circumstances. So ours breaks it out a little more and stuff like that. You know, this is obviously under the adult patient. Um, but, um, you know, so even on a BLS level is what they're saying is that after 20 minutes, okay, um, you can call the code, you know, so you have to, um, Call med you have to call medical control to be able to do it, but you can call the code. 
So I know a lot of times we're off the scene before then, but really, if you read the literature nowadays, they're saying that you should fully work a code in the house. And if you don't get the patient back, you should, um, I don't want to use the term pronounced, but you should decide to terminate the code and leave the patient in the house. So that's really that. Let me see if there's anything more over here. Okay. Not really. Okay. So Wayne, does that answer your question? Oops. Yeah, it does. So the reason I asked was because I heard we were going back to pre-corona. We got that. But then I also heard that there were changes being made that did take effect after corona. So that's why I was asking. And like you said, it just came out recently, those right. small changes. Yeah, so they're saying we're going back to pre-corona, um, everything pre-corona. Now, if we have another flare-up, flare I don't know what they're going to do because, you know, once you rescind it, it's kind of hard to put it back. I mean, if you think about it, I guess it was a week ago where the guidance was pretty much, you know, we were pronouncing everyone and nobody was getting transported. And then that hit the newspaper and there was a lot of bad press about that. So the commissioner of health, I guess, took a lot of flack from the governor and they immediately rescinded that one. And now a week later, they're going back to let's pretend COVID never happened and, you know, go back to the, um, you know, pre COVID days and stuff. So, so we'll have to, we'll have to see. They did say today in the conference call. I, I would that, say most people thought the pre Corona stuff made sense. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the post Corona stuff made sense and should have been in place for a long time. Now. Right. And that's how it is throughout the country. You know, I mean, if you read the document last week, they're even saying that what they put out is being done throughout the country. But, you know, we're in New York and it's a little backwards and there's a lot of politics involved. And, um, you know, so that's kind of what we're doing. I mean, I there's all you can you can go to the, you know, post COVID days that you're referring to by calling medical control. I mean, if you were to call medical control and say, you know, we've been working this patient for 20 minutes, um, you know, we have no uh, no shockable rhythm you know, uh, no return of spontaneous circulation, you know, the family's okay, you know, can we pronounce that patient? They would say yes. No, they're, they're, they're no longer, everything that we were kind of um, used to before doesn't exist. So the feeling now is that if a patient's cardiac arrest in the field and you do not save them within 20 minutes, there is no purpose in the world of transporting that patient to the hospital. It's a cost to the family. It's a danger to you. It's a danger to the public by driving lights and sirens. It's a, you know, uh, I don't want to say a waste of resources, but it's a, you know, it's a, a futile use of resources to try to resuscitate that patient. Because even, you know, one in a million chance that that patient is resuscitated in the emergency room, neurologically, their brain's gone. So all you've done is added a burden to the family, a cost to you know, the family, a cost to the healthcare system and everything like that. So, um, but they did say today in the conference call, the state conference call that, you know, they don't think that we're ever going to go back to the way things were done before. So everybody interpreted that as a statement like, you know, we're kind of backwards compared to the rest of the nation. So now we have some forward things such as, you know, being able to do CME by Zoom and stuff. The feeling now is that they may start to loosen some of the requirements up and, once COVID is done, say, okay, you know, if you were successful in conducting CME, you know, uh, this way, then continue to do it. And, um, you know, we seem to be much more, at least, well, I have to say every ambulance corps, um, much more successful conducting um, CME via Zoom than ever. You know, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, there's, there were some summer sessions where it was Amanda, Amanda and I uh, standing there talking about vegetable gardens and stuff. So um, this definitely seems to be an easier way for people to do it. So, you know, hopefully we'll continue with it. And, you know, this is a work in progress. So it, I definitely would love feedback, you know, as far as, um, you know, what we could do to make it better and stuff like that. I did email out the slides um, to Pete, but only about, uh, I guess, a half hour or 45 minutes before the lecture. So he'll send them all out to everyone so you have them. And, you know, in the future, I'll try to get them out earlier so you have them if you want. Okay. And again, after this is done, uh, once the video uh, finishes converting, I'll uh, upload it to YouTube and it'll be there, you know, if you ever want to see it again or anything like that. Or for somebody who wasn't able to sign on tonight, they could always go to that YouTube link, you know, look at it and then take the test and still get the uh, credit for it. Okay. Any questions on anything before we start? Okay. So I thought we'd talk about is, uh, you know, newborn resuscitation. So probably nothing is more scary, at least for me, is than having a baby that is not born healthy and has to be resuscitated. Thankfully, that very, very, very rarely happens. Has anybody ever had to 
uh, resuscitate a newborn baby. Now, I'm not talking about a SIDS death where we just kind of may do it just to, you know, make it look like we care. I'm talking about a baby that was actually born alive, okay, but not healthy and had to be resuscitated. You know, obviously a SIDS death would be a completely different situation where parents didn't do anything in the world wrong, okay? It's just that that baby, and again, they're not 100% certain why, but that baby, while asleep, probably went into some type of respiratory depression and, and died. Parents didn't know. There was you know, nothing the parents could have done differently. Uh, but when the parents noticed the kid didn't wake up and they went to wake them up, they find them, you know, cyanotic and, uh, you know, unfortunately dead. And, um, you know, we still get called, obviously. But at that point, it's more psychological first aid for the parents than it is really trying to resuscitate the baby because, you know, unfortunately they've passed away. So, I mean, I've done one of these actually, Rockland Psych, with you guys, and, and Glenn Albin was my BLS crew, and uh, Pete Kosenko, for those of you who have been around, was my brand new paramedic partner, so it was a pretty interesting uh, situation. It was born to a, um, a opi opioid-addicted mother, and that's why it was a depressed um, infant. Okay, so let's talk about it. So, you know, again, this is the latest and greatest from um, the NRP, the Neonatal Resuscitation Program, okay? It's slightly different from the state protocols and the Hudson Valley protocols and stuff like that, and I'll, I'll allude to what's different in those uh, situations, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about neonatal resuscitation. We're gonna go over the guidelines, okay, and, and the recommendations. So really, um, you know, you could speak to your grandparents and they remember that, you know, a large percentage of babies when they were born didn't survive, you know, through childbirth and stuff because uh, a baby that was born, you know, probably less than 100 years ago and was not breathing was considered dead and they didn't do anything for that baby. And now we know that just because the baby's born not breathing, it does not mean that they're going to be, um, you know, pronounced dead. We have things that we could do to resuscitate them. Okay. So just as some things of like the old days of what they used to do. Um, so the old days, a baby that was born not breathing, right, was basically flung around to try to stimulate them from breathing. And who knows, it may have, may have not worked. Okay. I don't know what trauma did to the baby's brain and the baby's neck and stuff like that, but okay. So here's some other things they did, rectal stimulation. Okay. So they shoved hopefully a finger, but here it says a corn cob, up the baby to try to stimulate it. Tobacco smoke blown into the baby's rectum, okay? Immersion in cold water and then warm water. So, you know, we're laughing, but, you know, this some of this stuff was done up until the 1950s. And, you know, I always say some of the things that we're doing today, people are going to laugh, you know, 20 years ago. Um, you know, I mean, some people have been doing this for a while. Remember the mass trousers, you know, and the mass trousers, when they came out, we were putting them on everyone, including cardiac arrests, traumas, cardiac arrests, fractures, everything in the world saying, you know, it was supposedly the greatest thing since sliced bread. And within a couple of years, they realized that, you know, patients weren't doing any better and patients that had penetrating trauma above the diaphragm were dying quicker. So nowadays, if you even have them, they probably, you know, are so dry rotted that if you put air into them, they would, uh, they would rupture. But back then, you know, it was the greatest thing since uh, sliced bread. So it's kind of the same thing here. Okay. And there's all different things that they used to do, um, you know, for the baby. Now this lady, okay, Virginia Apcar, she was a uh, female uh, physician, uh, OBGYN, okay, who was the first really uh, OBGYN who had the concept that a baby that was born um, without great signs of life could be resuscitated. And, you know, you've heard of the APCAR score. It's on the PCR and everything like that. This was the, um, she was the first person who developed this and developed the concept of not only classifying the patient, but resuscitating the patient. So, you know, and what we do nowadays as an assessment is based on, you know, what she talked about. The only thing that's different is her assessment was a little delayed from the time the baby was born, where now we assess immediately, right? As soon as the baby's born, we do an assessment. So and we'll go over that as we talk about it. So here's the APCAR score, okay? And, um, you know, um, the state still requires that on the, uh, on the PCR. So that's all, you know, I'm getting, you're doing electronics, so it's all probably, you know, easily calculated and stuff like that. Okay, so how often is resuscitation necessary? Not very often, okay, definitely not, okay. The vast majority of babies obviously are born healthy, crying, vigorous, and they don't really need uh, much to make that transition from life inside the mother's womb to outside the uh, mother's womb, okay. So again, 10% of babies require some assistance. Most of the times it's temperature regulation, okay. And only about 1% of babies born require extensive resuscitation. Okay, so it's very rare. And um, I didn't hear anybody chime in, they ever had to do one. So, you know, again, the vast majority of people don't. If you work in an area where there's, you know, um, less uh, prenatal care to the mother, 
uh, higher drug addictions and stuff like that, you may probably see more of that. So you look at this picture, okay, of this newborn baby. Is there anything they would say to you that this baby needs to be resuscitated or not resuscitated? All right, so what do you think? This, this little girl, right? Yeah, girl. What do you think? So good muscle tone, right? Looks like it's trying to trying to cry, okay? There may be a little cyanosis on the extremities, okay? But the core does not look like there's any real cyanosis. What's all this white stuff is called Vernax. Um, that's a protective covering that the baby is kind of uh, coated in and um, you know, it's fine. That's supposed to be there. And when the baby has its first uh, bath, that will all come off. It's a little blood. I would assume that's from a little vaginal tear in the mother. Okay. It doesn't look like it's coming anywhere from the baby or anything like that. So this is a, you know, healthy baby. I mean, it looks like it may even have a little, a little crying, but it's got good muscle tone. It's got good color. So at this point, you know, it would be drying the baby to prevent heat loss and wrapping the baby, right? There's not much else that really would need to be done. It looks like they already clamped the umbilical cord. Um, but, um, you know, it's really all that would really need to be done for this baby. So, you know, I remember the first time I delivered a baby, I, I saw the Vernax and I thought the child had some kind of skin disorder, you know, and I was like, oh my God, you know, what am I going to tell the mother? And the mother kept on saying, I want to see the baby. And I'm like, oh, give us a couple seconds. You know, I didn't even know what it was because nobody taught to me in, uh, in EMT class. So I didn't, you know, didn't even know what was going on with the baby. Okay, so this is what they call the inverted pyramid of uh, newborn resuscitation, right? So the concept is that the stuff towards the top pretty much gets done for most babies, okay? And the stuff towards the bottom is very rarely done. So assessment at birth, and we'll talk about what we assess, right? I mean, basically we don't do blood pressures on babies. So what we're doing is heart rate and respiratory rate and color, okay? And the simple care is to dry the baby and keep the baby warm and maybe a little positioning, okay? So that's done on pretty much all babies, okay? And then the babies that are not born full term and are not vigorous at birth get the next step which is, you know, drying warmth, clearing the airway and some stimulation, okay? So I think EMS wise, we do a lot of that routinely, but they say it doesn't really need to be done. And then we go on and assess a respiratory rate and assess a heart rate, okay? So I know most of you are muted, but you know, at birth, a normal respiratory rate is pretty much around 40 to 60 breaths per minute. So that's faster than we would, most of us would think would be normal for that child. But that is a normal respiratory rate. And a normal heart rate is close to probably 150 beats per minute. So when we're doing this initial assessment to determine whether or not we need to do positive pressure ventilation, we're checking the baby's heart rate and respiratory rate. If the, heart, if the respiratory rate is below 40 breaths per minute, we're going to have to ventilate. Now, I know some of you think positive pressure ventilation, you know, is the old demand valves and, and you know, Robert Shores and stuff like that. To them, positive pressure ventilation is the bag valve mask, okay? And you're, you should have on your ambulance a newborn size bag valve mask, an infant size bag valve mask, a child size bag valve mask, and a adult size bag valve mask. Some people have a large child and a small child besides an infant, but you need to have a newborn, right? Uh, and then a child and then any, um, I'm sorry, a newborn, then an infant, then a child and then a uh, adult at minimum. And again, multiple size masks so that, you know, they all, uh, you can take into account for all different face sizes and stuff like that. So when they're talking about positive pressure ventilation, they're talking about a bag valve mask. Now remember, once we get out of the adult size bag valve masks, all the pediatric size have what they call a pressure relief valve or a pop-off valve. And that's a little valve on the side of the bag valve mask, you know, uh, where the bag connects to the actual hard plastic that goes down to the mask. Um, it's a little pressure relief valve that's set for 40 centimeters of water, okay? And 40 centimeters of water is about the highest pressure your lungs will ever really uh, want to be exposed to. And the only time you were probably ever exposed to that was the first two breaths. The first two or three breaths you take when you're born, um, at the highest pressures your lungs were ever will ever be exposed to unless you had some kind of something horrible happen to you. Um, and... Um, that's because you have to do what with those breaths? You have to expand your lungs, your lung, pa your breathing passageways, and you have to expel the um, amniotic fluid that's probably down in your lungs. Because remember, obviously, when you were in utero, you were swimming in amniotic fluid that was coming in and out of your mouth because you didn't need to breathe when you're in utero because you were getting blood, you know, oxygenated blood directly from the um, your mo your mom. Okay, so you didn't need to worry about anything like that. So. The bag valve mask you're using for the newborn resuscitation should be a neonatal size and should have a pop-off valve. And the pop-off valve should be able to release pressure. Now, all pop-off valves have a switch 
where you can override that in case you can't get good chest rise. Hold on one second. Yes. Good. I'm on a conference call. What's up? No, just tell me what's up. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Okay, I'll make a phone call. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so, you know, uh, again, as far as the pressure relief gap goes, most of the times we want it in the open position so we don't overpressurize the baby's lungs. But if you can't get chest rise, that means the baby's lungs are stiff because, you know, that sometimes happens and you need to then override the pop off valves as a switch that stops it from venting the pressure. But now the onus of responsibility is on you, right? So if you don't pay attention and you overventilate that baby, you can cause a pneumothorax. So the only time you would override the pressure relief valve would be as if you couldn't get good chest rise. Um, so that's something good. I know you guys do those fast tracks uh, sessions and stuff before your meetings. It would always be a good idea to take out the neonatal bag valve mask or the infant bag valve mask and show that and also take out a, a small infant uh, CPR mannequin and try to have somebody ventilate that mannequin at a rate of 40, 60 breaths per minute and not overpressurize it. So it's, it's a very hard skill and nobody ever does it, right? Because thankfully we never have to do it. And so on after, if you're doing positive pressure uh, uh, ventilations because either the breathing was slow or the heart rate was below 100, at assessment, because again, a normal heart rate would be 150, you do that for 30 seconds and then you reassess if the heart rate at drops below 60, now you start chest compressions. And if the heart rate after doing chest compressions for 30, 60 seconds continues to stay low, you have to add medications to it, which obviously would be at an ALS level. So we'll go over that step by step as we uh, go on. So the first thing we need to do is, was the baby born at term, right? So it's gonna say, in other words, this is a healthy baby born at full term. Everybody knows that a full term baby is 38 to 40 weeks, okay? So was it born at term? Okay, did it have clear amniotic fluid? So was there no signs of meconium? Meconium is the baby's first bowel movement and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, is the baby breathing or crying? And does it have good muscle tone? So the pictures of those babies we see there, okay, which again, you know, if you've never delivered a baby or you never held a baby, you may be a little concerned, right? I mean, most, most people have never seen a newborn baby kind of, you know, freaks them out. But a screaming, crying baby is a good thing. And there's always a thing in emergency medicine. It's a, you know, a crying baby is a stable baby. It's the quiet babies that we fear. So if they're crying, that's always a good sign, right? Because we know that they have an intact airway and that they their brain is getting enough perfusion that they're upset about something. They feel discomfort or something like that. So it's telling us that their brain is working, okay? So if that's the case, if they're full term, right? They have clear amniotic fluid, they're breathing or crying and have good muscle tone. We dry them, we wrap them, and we'll talk about how we wrap them, okay? Um, maintain an airway. So if you're gonna put them, you know, you're gonna put them flat on their back, if they have a very large occiput, the back of their head, um, you may need to put some padding under their shoulders if you see their airway flexing forward, okay? And then you're gonna go on and assess them. And you're gonna assess for color. Okay, you're gonna assess for heart rate and you're gonna assess for respiratory rate. It is normal for a newborn baby to have cyanosis over their extremities. It is not normal for them to have cyanosis over their core, their chest and their abdomen. Okay. A normal respiratory rate we said should be 40 to 60. We're very concerned if it's below 40, especially if it's below 30. And a normal heart rate at birth should be around 150. Um, the lowest number that we will tolerate without starting resuscitation is 100. 100 is not a good number, but it's the lowest number that we'll tolerate um, before we have to start resuscitating. And if we is below 100, our initial resuscitation would be to use the bag valve mask at a rate of 40 to 60 breaths per minute. And it's very, you know, you're not going to have a situation where a baby has a heart rate of 90 and is breathing at 40 to 60 breaths per minute, right? Because if their heart rate is slow, they're going to be hypoxic, so they're not going to be breathing that fast. So, you know, you'll be you'll be breathing for them at that rate of 40, 60 breaths per minute. Okay, so then we don't know a lot about what babies look like, sizes and stuff like that. So I have a whole bunch of pictures coming up of looking at you know, a, you know, a normal birth weight baby versus a little bit of a low birth weight baby versus maybe a baby that's large for gestational age, right? So a, a baby that's large for gestational age may present a, a problem you know, as far as your ability to deliver that baby. You know, when you come upon a mother that's in labor, you know, I know in EMT class, they told you a bunch of different questions to ask, but the first question I always ask, you know, were you planning, you know, was the doctor planning on delivering this baby vaginally? You know, so if they say, no, I was going to be a C-section, you're immediately transporting, 
because whatever the reason is going to be, you'll find out later. But if they are a scheduled C-section, we don't do C-sections. So there's no way that you want to be on the scene with that baby. Now, if they tell you later it's an elective C-section because maybe they had a previous one or, you know, for whatever reason, that's different. But, you know, God forbid it's something where it can't be vaginally delivered, like a baby that's large, a born, you know, large for gestational age, and they're just too big to get through the mother's birth canal. And I think everybody realizes that's the, the biggest problem with that are babies that go beyond 40 weeks, okay, go past their you know, normal term gestation, are also babies that are born to diabetic mothers. Now, that could be a woman who's a diabetic all the time, or a woman who develops what's called gestational diabetes brought on by the stress of the pregnancy. Because, you know, in utero, those babies were exposed to high sugar levels, they tend to grow pretty big, and they sometimes become a problem to vaginally deliver them. And remember, even though the mother may say they're going to be vaginally delivered, in the hospital, they have many more ways to vaginally deliver a baby than we do, right? We're dependent on the mother pushing it out. They have vacuums, they have assist devices and everything. So if that mother says she's a diabetic, okay, and, you know, I would just get going because, you know, I mean, if you have to deliver, you have to try to deliver, but it may just be too big to come down, okay? Okay, so we said that our, you know, here was our parameters. Now I asked over here, what assessment parameters are missing from the previous recommendations? So we used to ask, you know, right off the bat, was the baby pink? Well, we know now that babies at birth, okay, can appear a little cyanotic. So we give them about 30 seconds. And, you know, after about 30 seconds, they should pink up over the core. And after a couple of minutes, they should pink up over the extremities, okay? So again, that's why it was removed because it's normal for a baby to be a little, you know, cyanotic uh, at, at birth. And then, you know, once they start screaming and crying and moving blood around, if they stay cyanotic over their core, what are we going to do? So if they're staying cyanotic over their core, you want to make sure you did a great job drying them, that they are wrapped and warm. Now, sometimes when we wrap them, we leave their chest exposed so we can see their breathing. But if we leave their chest exposed, then they're going to get cold. So it's a double-edged sword. And I'll show you the new thing they want to wrap them in, okay, versus the old aluminum foil. Okay. Um, if they remain with cyanosis over their core, you could always try a little blow by oxygen. And I'll show you how to do that to uh, pick them up. Okay, and then what initial treatment? So we used to routinely uh, use bulb suctioning when the baby's head presented on the perineum, right? As soon as the baby's head came out of the mother and it was on the mother's perineum, we used to do suctioning. And, you know, it used to be that you wanted to suction the mouth and the nose type of thing. So they found no um, benefit in that whatsoever in all the studies. And there was a risk of what they call vagaling the baby, you know, stimulating the baby to have a vagal response. So they took out routine bulb syringe suctioning of the of the baby. Okay. So that's the reason why. Okay. So in the initial steps of a baby who needs to be resuscitated. Okay. So they're all getting those initial steps, which is the drawing, okay, and the wrapping up the baby. And then you go on with your assessment. Okay. Positioning we talked about that you may need to put a little shoulder um, padding, right? Some uh, a folded towel, you know, just to bring the shoulders up to the same level as the occiput, the back of the baby's head. Okay. The airway may need to be suctioning at that point. So you would use your bulb syringe. Okay. And again, airway, they're talking both mouth and nose. Remember, babies are what they call obligatory nose breathers. So that means that they will, they choose to breathe through their nose, not through their mouth. And that is because babies are designed to breastfeed. Okay. And obviously when they're suckling on a mother's breast, they're using their mouth, which means their mouth is not available to breathe through. So they need to breathe through their nose. So it's very important to keep you know, a baby's nose clean. It's actually very important to keep all pediatric baby, uh, all pediatric patients' noses clear. Um, and that's sometimes a good use for the bulb syringe, which is, you know, may get a little, take a little um, uh, water and squirt it up the baby's nose. But, you know, uh, when we used to have the syringes and the nasal atomizers for the Narcan, that was also, uh, you could put some sterile water in a syringe and use the nasal atomizer to loosen up the mucus. But now that we went to those one shot ones, we can't do that anymore. Okay, the next step would be determine if you need to do positive pressure ventilation. And again, that's based on the baby's respiratory rate, and we want to see it somewhere to 40, 60 breaths per minute. If it's not, we're going to ventilate at a rate of 40, 60 breaths per minute. If after 30 seconds of ventilations at 40, 60 breaths per minute, the baby's heart rate, I'm sorry, the baby's heart rate continues to decline, it goes below 60, we're going to start chest compressions. Okay. And then if the baby's a gift another 30, 60 seconds, the baby's heart rate doesn't come above 60, they can, uh, the paramedics consider giving epinephrine down the end tracheal tube. Okay. But I, like I said, once in my life, I've, I, I've had to do that. And I don't really recall anybody else ever having to do that. 
Okay. So progression from steps, usually about 30 to 60 seconds of doing something. And it's always based on respirations, heart rate, and color. Again, a normal respiratory rate, 30 to 60, a normal heart rate, 150. On the heart rate, if it's below 100, we have to intervene and we start by intervening by positive pressure ventilation. Color-wise, after say a minute, they should be uh, pink over their central core part of their body, their chest and their abdomen, and they can continue to have some peripheral cyanosis for a couple of minutes. Okay, so again, around 15 to 30 seconds between each step. Okay, how do we assess heart rate? So the brachial pulse that you learn in CPR is a totally useless site to assess heart rate. And in fact, if you were to have to check your own brachial pulse right now, you probably, most of you have a hard time finding it. And trying to find a brachial pulse in a newborn is next to impossible for a couple of different reasons. It's a small blood vessel, okay? It's got a low blood pressure because it's in the arm and it, the baby itself has a low blood pressure. And you're scared and you're gonna press down on that arm and you're just gonna shut the pulse off. You're gonna press with such force, you know, that you're gonna shut it off. So it's a useless, um, you know, place to assess. So there's two ways you could assess a uh, heart rate. Okay. After you clamp the uh, umbilical cord, you can assess between the baby's umbilicus, their buddy, uh, belly button, and the clamp. So you grab the cord right between the baby's body and the clamp. Okay. You can't go past the clamp. And you could feel pulsation in the cord. Okay. And that relates to the baby's heart rate. Or you could take your stethoscope and listen for the baby's apical heart rate, which is the, the pounding sound you'll hear. Okay, now remember, it's going to be quieter than you probably think, and it's going to be fast because hopefully that baby has a heart rate of 150 beats per minute. So, you know, it's going, to, it's going to be sometimes hard to differentiate, you know, what the actual heart rate is. But that's the only two ways you can do an accurate heart rate assessment in a newborn. Okay, now this is the newborn resuscitation algorithm. I, I kind of blew it up a little bit over here, but I think this one works a little better. Okay, so it's the same thing, just a different color coded. So I broke it down into pieces here, okay? So we said the first thing we're gonna do is, is the baby a term gestation? If the answer is yes, then we say, is the baby breathing or crying? Yes. Does the baby have good tone? Yes. If everything's yes, it's routine care. So you prevent heat loss and you continue to evaluate the baby. If it's no, and they could stay with the mother, right? So if it's no, then we need to continue to prevent heat loss because remember the two things that kill a newborn are, are hypo, hypothermia, cold, and hypoxia. So we want to definitely um, dry them and wrap them. And wrapping means that they're totally wrapped, head, chest, everything. Okay. Unless you need to do chest compressions and maybe even you do need to do chest compressions. Once you, you can kind of reach inside and find your spot and then wrap the, the covering back over your fingers. Okay. Make sure the baby's airway is open. Okay. Some tactile stimulation on their um, flicking the soles of their feet, rubbing their back, okay? And then you're gonna assess their respiratory rate and heart rate, okay? So here they're just looking at heart rate. If it's below 100 or if they're gasping or apneic, okay? You're gonna go down, okay? And you're going to start positive pressure ventilation. Again, that's the bag valve mask, okay? And the bag valve mask would be at a rate of 40 to 60 breaths per minute, okay? You're gonna, if you have a neonatal size pulse oximetry, you could put it on them. And here is the numbers that you would expect to see. Okay, so none of those numbers are what we normally expect of 94%. Again, that's probably mainly because you're looking at it at the finger or the earlobe, and there's not going to be a lot of blood flow at that, you know, that point to the finger and the earlobe. So, you know, we definitely tolerate lower numbers. Okay. Um, so again, if the heart rate continues to be below um, 100, you want to make sure that you're actually getting air in. Okay. Um, you may need to disable that pop-off valve, maybe add some supplemental oxygen to your bag valve mask. I didn't mention that, but the initial ventilating of a newborn is done with room air, okay? It's not done with oxygen, okay? So, but if it continues on where you're ventilating the child for 30 to 60 seconds and the heart rate remains below 100, you'd want to make sure the airway's open, okay? That there was no leaks, that you had a good seal, because again, you're not intubating, you're just using the mask at this point, okay? You may need to uh, disable the pop-off valves if you're not getting chest rise to increase the pressure, and you're going to add some supplemental oxygen to the bag valve mask. Okay. Now, you're going to, again, do that for another 30, 60 seconds. You're going to reassess. If the heart rate stays below 100 and above 60, then you're stuck ventilating all the way to the hospital. If the heart rate goes below 60, okay, you're going to start chest compressions. But let me just go the other way first. If the heart rate goes back above 100, so you did a great job, you were ventilating the kid, you stabilize the kid, the heart rate went above 100. 
you don't want to immediately stop the bag valve mask. I would go another 15 to 30 seconds with the bag valve mask. And then I would switch the baby off from the bag valve mask to blow by oxygen. So I would just take, if you have a small, um, simple face mask, or even the end of an oxygen tubing, cup your hand, you know, make like a little cup your hand with the, the oxygen into it and hold it a, you know, half inch, inch away from the baby's face at about six liters per minute. And you just want to increase the ambient amount of oxygen the baby's breathing in. And if the baby's heart rate stays above 100, then over a couple of minutes, you could start increasing the distance, you know, in other words, start to wean them off the oxygen and see if they keep their heart rate up. If they don't keep their heart rate up, then keep them on the oxygen to the hospital. Okay. Now, I know some of you may have heard there's an issue with the oxygen being blown on the baby's eyes. So, you know, we're not blowing the oxygen on the baby's eyes. We're giving it to their mouth and nose. And that's 100% oxygen for long periods of time. So you don't have to fear if you have a child who needs oxygen, giving them oxygen in the short term. Okay. Now, if the heart rate goes below 60, even though you were doing the bag valve mask, then you start chest compressions. Okay. So the chest compressions of neonatal CPR are a little different than uh, what you learned before. So you learned infant and you probably learned 15 to two if you were doing two person and 30 to two if you were doing one person at a rate of 100 to 120 compressions per minute. Newborn resuscitation is three compressions to one ventilation. So you've never probably had that before. Okay. At a rate of 120 compressions per minute. Okay. Then the bag valve mask has 100% oxygen going into it. And on an ALS level, we would consider intubating because you know that when you're compressing on someone's chest, especially a small chest, it's hard to get that air down in there. Okay, and then do that for another 30 to 60 seconds. And if the heart rate continues to be below 60, they'd have, they would have to start considering getting uh, vascular access, okay, which probably would be an atrocious and giving them fluids, maybe some Narcan if it's a, a baby born to an opioid addicted mother, um, you know, some epi and some... Uh, possibly a little bit of fluid. And saying that, I would think it's going to be rapid transport to the hospital. I think that most people would not feel comfortable doing this, and it would be rapid transport to the hospital, doing CPR and ventilating the patient. And that's totally appropriate. But please, please give them a lot of early notification, because they're going to have to have the pediatric hospitalists come down. They're going to have to have the neonatal nurses come down. If there's a neonatologist in the hospital, they have to come down. Anesthesia, because, you know, people are not used to doing these types of things on a regular basis. Probably the only ones that are used to doing this would be the, the neonatologists and the neonatal nurses. Okay, now as far as maintenance of body temperature, okay, so the colder the baby is, the more likely they're going to die, whether it be premature or not premature, so we do not want to let the babies get cold. Wet babies get cold very quickly, so we need to dry them, and when you dry them, you can be a little vigorous because you want to stimulate them, right? Having them cry is a good thing. Okay, so you definitely would want to, you know, be vigorous with it and like don't lay, don't leave them wrapped in any wet linens or anything like that. Obviously, we don't have radiant warmers in the ambulances. Okay, I don't know if Glenn's on, but if he is on, you may be getting one. Okay, now the silver swaddler. Okay, which was a mainstay of uh, EMS, which is this aluminum sleeping bag. They do not like. And for a very simple reason, which is you cannot assess the baby, you cannot see the baby breathing, you can't do anything with it. So they like this food grade heat resistant plastic. Okay. So I'm sure it's out there. I know they sell a version of the silver swaddler where it's this basically clear sleeping bag um, where you could see the baby. And they say that actually if it's if the ambulance or if the room is colder than the baby is, you'll actually see condensation on the inside of the um, the uh, plastic. Okay. And the reason obviously it has to be food grade and everything is you don't want to leach any carcinogenics or anything into the baby. So that's kind of the, the reason why. The uh, helicopter uses this, the staff flight teams use this and everything like that. So it's definitely out there. I've seen them where they have like a elastic uh, little head part that the head goes into and keeps them off their face and stuff like that. So if you only have the silver swaddler, you, obviously that's what you would use. But the problem is to be able to assess the baby you have to expose the chest, and if you have to expose the chest, the baby's going to get cold. Okay, so I'm going to stop for a second um, just to see if anybody has any questions on anything. So if you do, just unmute yourself. And uh, any questions? Okay. Um, just want to see. I don't see any chats. Okay, no problem. 
Oh, so we're up to 20 people now. Okay, so supplemental oxygen. So we're not talking about using um, the bag valve mask or anything. We're talking that we may have used a bag valve mask and now we, we need to wean them off them. Or maybe the baby had a heart rate above 100, but have persistent central cyanosis, right? So, you know, again, you expect to see some peripheral cyanosis, but this baby had per, uh, persistent central cyanosis. Okay, so in that case, um, we can give some supplemental oxygen. So there's two ways that you could do it. One is you could take the oxygen tubing, okay, run it at about six liters per minute, okay, and hold it, you know, somewhere between a half inch to an inch from the baby's face and, um, you know, increase the, whoops, increase the ambient oxygen that's being breathed, uh, breathed in. If you have a small enough simple face mask, you could also um, do it that way. So that's what those two pictures are showing over there. Okay. And again, same thing they're just showing you. Okay, they're showing you positioning of the bag valve mask, okay, over here. Okay. So there are concerns about too much oxygen in babies, just like too much oxygen in, in adults and stuff like that. So we don't just give oxygen. Years ago, you know, people may remember that when a baby was born, as soon as they came out, we gave them oxygen because that was the latest and greatest standards that they uh, put out back then. But, you know, nowadays we don't give um, oxygen unless there's a need for oxygen. So that's why we even start out the bag valve mask in a baby who has a heart rate below 100 with uh, room air. We don't even hook it up to oxygen at that point. And I have to be honest with you, you know, what we're talking about tonight, I would say, freely say 99% of the people in the field right now, paramedics and EMTs have no idea. You know, years ago, we used to do NRP on a regular basis, but the state took it out as a requirement. So unless people on their own are taking these types of courses, you know, they, they would, you know, not know the latest and greatest and stuff like that. Okay, so again, most of the evidence says that room air is just as effective as 100% oxygen in babies. Okay, so the only time we go 100% oxygen is we're doing CPR on them. Okay, okay. Uh, once adequate ventilation is established and you have good lung inflation, okay, if the heart rate begins, be, remains low, then we need to move on to compressions. So, you know, once we've ruled out cold as a cause and hypoxia as a cause, okay, now we need to go and start doing um, some type of supporting of their heart rate by doing CPR, okay. Um, again, we said supplemental oxygen could also be considered in babies with persistent central cyanosis. So that would be that the baby's heart rate is good, their respiratory rate is good. You know they're warm, you've dried them off, but they're central, they still have central cyanosis. And then you could give them some supplemental oxygen and route to the hospital. Okay. Um, they do not know what the right numbers are. That's pretty much everything in medicine that they do not 100% know what the right numbers are. And so it's always a, a best guess. Okay. Meconium is the baby's first bowel movement that happened in utero. It should not happen in utero. It should happen after the baby is born. And the danger, obviously, is that when the baby's in utero, it's floating in the amniotic sac, floating in amniotic fluid. So if it goes to the bathroom, it can aspirate that meconium, that fecal matter, right, into its lungs and, gets what, and get a syndrome called meconium aspiration syndrome. So the side effects of meconium aspiration syndrome can be bradycardia, right? Because you're getting hypoxic. So, you know, you have this now poops in your lung field, so you're not ventilating well. And if you're not ventilating well, you get hypoxic. The heart needs oxygen to be able to beat. So if the hot heart does not get oxygen, they get bradycardic. Now, the way years ago, you saw meconium, it was a huge emergency, you know, and, and everything. So the way they break it out now is that if there's thin watery meconium, Okay, so in other words, if there's a little meconium visible, but the baby is vigorous, is moving and crying, no big deal. Okay, if the baby has thick, pasty, almost looking like poops meconium and is not vigorous, not crying, not breathing, then that is a big deal. The problem is that you have a bulb syringe and that's the most suctioning you could do, which is the mouth and the nose. And we're talking about meconium that's got down into the lungs. You have no way, real way of doing that. So for you guys, it would be rapid transport. Um, but I'll show you what the paramedics have available to use. Again, 99% of the paramedics have never used it, okay? So meconium aspiration syndrome, that's what MAS is, okay? So intrapartum suctioning is what, we, um, what you would do so that when the baby's head is on the perineum, okay, you would suction out the mouth and the nose, uh, useless delays transport, you know, of, of no real, maybe makes you feel like you're doing something, but of no benefit to the baby. Now, deep tracheal suctioning, okay, can be of some benefit. So to do deep tracheal suctioning, you have to be able to intubate. So you have this device, 
you would, and just so you know what it looks like if they ever, you know, ask you for help, you would hook your suction um, tubing, right, that comes off the suction machine to this. The endotracheal tube, you can see it over here, the part that normally the bag valve mask would go on to, would plug into over here. So you see here, here's your suction tubing, here's your endotracheal tube. They would intubate the baby, and normally this would get hooked up after they intubate, but they would intubate the baby. Then a, a, they'd have this suction already attached. They would hook this device onto the endotracheal tube. And when they put their finger over this hole over here, the suction now comes through the endotracheal tube. So if there's anything in the trachea or the upper part of the bronchi, they should be able to suction it out. The obviously risk factor is that you're removing oxygen and you're vagaling the baby so you can have a precipitous drop in their heart rate. So it's not without risk, but you know, you have to at least try it to see if you can get some of the meconium out. Okay, so again, all this is saying that, you know, in a lot of studies, they've shown that that bulb syringe um, suctioning, you know, on the perineum is, you know, not of any use. It doesn't reduce the in incidence of meconium aspiration syndrome, can vagal the baby, just waste time and stuff like that. So they do not recommend that um, anymore. Again, this is the American Academy of Pediatrics, their neonatal resuscitation program. Okay, so again, um, another study, okay, showed that tracheal intubation and suctioning meconium state babies that were vigorous at birth was of no benefit and not recommended. So again, that's going back towards if the babies are crying and moving, we kind of just leave them the way they are. And we note it to the nurses and we note it in the, in the uh, chart that you saw signs of meconium, okay? And the reason why they kind of got away from it was, that, you know, it's always benefit versus risk. So the risk was that you're going to Brady down the baby and slow down their heart rate and they're going to get, they could die actually. Um, and they're, you know, you weren't really preventing um, meconium aspiration syndrome because those babies that are vigorous usually did not have it. Okay, there's no studies looking at meconium in depressed babies and whether or not they should be suctioned, but we do. Okay, so we routinely do deep tracheal suctioning in those babies, but there's no studies comparing ones that had it and didn't have it because they all have it. So there's no way of knowing that if you didn't do it, how they would turn out. This is showing you what it would look like. Again, your suction tubing would go over here. This would be inside the baby. This would be sticking you know, out of the baby's mouth. This is the endotracheal tube, obviously a newborn size. And there's no suction until whoever is doing the suctioning puts their thumb over here. So that's called the whistle valve or the flutter valve, just like you have on your flexible suction catheters. Okay, so that's basically what it looks like. Okay, so your initial breaths, okay, that when you're ventilating a baby, just realize those first two breaths, first three breaths are very, very important and that you do have a pop-off valve that's set for, most of them are set for 40 sodomies of water pressure. So that if you ventilate and you don't see chest rise, it just means those babies, that baby's lungs are full of still of fetal lung tissue. I'm sorry, not lung tissue, fetal lung fluid. And that's why they're not going up. Um, again, you're never gonna have a C-section baby, but babies that are born by C-section do not ha have the benefit of the, um, the vaginal delivery. And when a baby goes through the vagina, it's squeezed and crushed onto, right? And it actually helps with getting a lot of that fluid out of the baby's lung fields. And then the first two breaths that the baby takes, or three breaths or four, or whatever, that's what really expands the lungs. It actually makes the blood flow go the right way, right? So when they're in utero, we all know that the blood comes in the right atrium and that we all have a hole in our septal wall between our right atrium and left atrium, right? That's that hole that everybody always worries about. So blood goes, when you're in, a, when you're in your mother, blood goes from the right atrium, okay, to your left atrium and it bypasses your lungs. So normally right now, all of us have blood going into our right atrium, right ventricle, pumps out into the pulmonary artery, goes to the lungs, gets rid of CO2, gets oxygen, comes back the pulmonary vein into the left atrium, goes down to the left ventricle and gets pumped to your body. That's normal circulation. In utero, you don't need that because your lungs are not working to oxygenate. You're getting your oxygen through the placenta from your mom. So what happens there is that the blood goes into your right atrium, goes through the hole, okay, in the septal wall, and goes into your left atrium and then gets pumped into your left ventricle and gets pumped around to the body. Okay, so it bypasses the right pulmonary circulation. Um, so when you take those first couple of breaths, one of the miracles of life is that actually that hole is still there, but blood starts going in the right direction. So everything goes according to the way it should. And usually over a couple of days, that hole starts to close and you know, from 
the vast majority of us closes completely. There are some babies where the hole stays open and that becomes a problem because they have some blood that bypasses the lungs now. They have some blood that goes from the right side right to the left side and not the same amount of blood is going to the lungs. So those babies, um, you know, they used to call them blue babies. They used to be chronically cyanotic. It used to be surgery. They had to wait to do it. Now they have a lot of things they could actually do in utero. They have a lot of things they could do once the baby's born short of surgery itself. So it's not a, a, as big a deal. But just to realize when you're ventilating the baby, if you can't get chest rise, then you have to disable the pop-off valve. And that's something every pop-off valve is different and every bag valve mask. So that's something you guys will have to practice depending on the bag valve mask you have on the neonatal size. And um, also just remember that once you disable a pop-off valve, whatever you squeeze goes into the baby. So if you overventilate, Okay, you can cause a pneumothorax. So you want to ventilate just as normal, just to you see chest rise. Okay, normal ventilatory rate here it's 30 to 60. Sometimes we say 40 to 60. Okay, but they don't know um, what the actual right amount of numbers are, right? What the amount, right amount of breaths per minute are. They're assuming that it's the, you know, the number that the baby normally should breathe. That's why we go with 40 to 60. So it's just showing you all the different equipment that should be available when you do a uh, a newborn resuscitation. Okay. Their bag valve masks have pressure gauges on them so they could see the exact amount of pressure they're delivering. You can actually buy um, bag valve masks that do have pressure gauges on them, um, even disposable ones. So they, they are out there. Um, I saw them at Pearl River Ambulance. I think you know they ordered them by accident, but they, you know, they did have them on there. They didn't know what they were, but they did have them on there. Uh, babies that are born but need some ventilatory support and they don't need to be intubated, they use CPAP just like we use CPAP on them. So that's this is a little device that they have there. And this, if you ever see a NICU, you know, where they have babies that are having some issues, this would be something that you would routinely see. I mean, and this is an older style one, but this is something you routinely see them on either CPAP or BiPAP. Again, make sure you have multiple size masks, okay, for all your different size babies besides the right size bag valve masks and stuff like that, okay? Make sure that when you're holding, you're keeping the airway in a neutral position, right? We don't hyperextend, okay? And you may need some padding under the shoulders, okay? You wanna make sure you're lifting the lower jaw, the mandible upwards because the tongue is attached to the mandible. And by lifting the jaw upwards towards the ceiling, you're displacing the tongue about it away and make sure that the mouth is always a little open, okay? Um, not that you have to worry about intubation or anything like that, but you know there may be some need to intubate um, sometimes, okay? I wouldn't say, you, you know, if you're getting good chest rise, and the baby's heart rate's above 100, and even the baby's heart rate's close to 150, there's probably no need to intubate. Okay. Um, okay, just different size um, endotracheal tubes that you would use. Okay, so the lower birth weight ones, you know, down to 2.5, 3. And just for reference point, the average adult patient female is intubated with a 7.5, and an adult male typically an 8.0. So uh, just from reference and stuff like that. Okay, um, whenever somebody gets intubated, it's very important. I don't know if you can make it out. Yeah, you can make it out a little bit. If you notice all these numbers along here, these are centimeters, the length of the endotracheal tube. So when you intubate somebody, okay, you want to make note of what number is at the lip line. Some people use the te teeth, but the lip line, so that if the tube gets dislodged, and you now notice the number is different, you can tell whether you pushed it too far in or pulled it too far out. Okay, then they have this little acronym, okay, for, you know, times that you think there's an airway issue, so Mr. Sopa. So again, the M is adjust the mask, make sure you have a good seal, okay, R is reposition the head to make sure the airway is open, okay, S is suctioning if you need to, right, O is opening the mouth and lifting the jaw forward, okay, P is pressure, right, so again, you're going to gradually increase pressure to see chest rise, and then the last step would be that you may need to go to some type of artificial airway, which again, you know, on a BLS level, you're not going to have access to. If the heart rate after you're bagging them drops below 60, we said we have to go to chest uh, chest compressions. So the only thing that's different from the chest compressions you normally do is that they're at a rate of 120 compressions per minute. So again, you're doing 100 to 120 compressions per minute, but it's three to one. It's not 30 to two. It's not uh, 15 to two. Okay, it's it's uh, three to one for NRP. So you wind up delivering 90 compressions per minute. Okay, and 30 breaths per minute.
Okay. The best way to do CPR on a res for a resuscitation standpoint is the hands encircling with the thumbs on the chest. And that gives the person who's doing the airway complete access to the head versus if you were standing alongside the baby, your shoulder is going to be in the person who's doing the airways uh, face. So they don't have the same ability to manage the airway. Okay, um, endotracheal tubes, again, you don't really have to worry about. Um, we don't do UV lines. UV lines are umbilical vein catheter lines. Um, that's how we used to get access in babies when we need to give them medicine and stuff. But the problem is with a UV line is that the umbilical vein goes right to the liver. So if there's any contamination, the baby's really going to have a raging infection and get septic. So we don't typically do them in the field anymore. So if they had to give medications to a baby, they would probably go with a intraosseous. Um, the drill intraosseous is good for babies that are probably a little, um, I think it's three kilos, so probably 6.6 .6 pounds and above. So if they're below that, they would need to go with the manual um, intraosseous. So that's what you're seeing here. Okay. Volume, again, you don't have to really worry about that on a BLS level, but sometimes, you know, if they think something's going on, maybe there's some bleeding from the, um, the umbilical cord or something like that, they may need some volume. Okay. The, the main medication used in newborns, if their heart rate stays below 60, despite doing CPR and ventilating them and making sure they're warm and oxygenated, would be epinephrine. Again, very rarely done. And by the time they figured out the weight specific dose should probably be at the hospital. It's pretty, it's pretty hard uh, calculation and stuff like that. So um, Narcan. Okay, so I put this in here. So, you know, we know that we have mothers that are opioid addicts that, you know, are pregnant and giving birth and stuff like that. So those babies, okay, are going to be born uh, with two issues. One, the opioid, just like it slows the respiratory rate and slows the respiratory depth, that's called tidal volume, how deep they breathe. In the mother, it also does that to the baby. So you could have a baby that one is born unconscious or very difficult to arouse, that's the opioid. Okay, you could have a baby that has pinpoint pupils, that's the opioid. You could have a baby whose respiratory rate is slow. And again, we said normal is 40 to 60, okay? Um, or shallow, right? They don't have good tidal volume. They're not moving air very well. Okay, now because of that, they're going to be get bradycardic. And because of that, they may even get cold, okay, because of uh, their low heart rate. So there's a lot of different things that could happen. The problem is that the intranasal Narcan you have will not work, okay? Um, it's way too much. And if you were to give them that whole dose, that's four milligrams you have in that intranasal Narcan, that one shot Narcan they would go into immediate withdrawal, they'd start seizing, and you'd have a catastrophe on your hands. So there's nothing that you could do for these babies other than to ventilate them, okay? So if they were born with a slow respiratory rate, you know, a shallow respiratory rate, you would just ventilate them, okay? If the paramedics came um, and they could figure out the weight-specific dose I have down there, it's 0.1 milligram per kilogram, okay, of body weight, um, then they could administer that. But it's, uh, you know, the way you have it preloaded, one shot, you know, four milligrams, you can't, uh, you can't do that to the baby. They'll have seizures right off the bat because you'll throw them into withdrawal, okay? Um, some other problems they have, so prematurity, okay, babies born, you know, prior to the 38 weeks and stuff like that tend to be very low weight. When they're low weight, they don't have a lot of brown fat, which is the insulating fat, okay? So they have a hard time maintaining their temperature. So temperature regulatory is problem. Also, the lung development, um, you need something in your lungs called surfactant, which helps keep your alveoli expanded. So surfactant is typically only produced after you go, I think it's 32 weeks or something like that. Or um, So they're born real early. They don't have the surfactant, so they're going to have a hard time keeping their alveoli open to have uh, gas exchange. So there's a lot of things that go wrong with premature babies. Most of the times they bring these babies and these mothers in early and stuff like that. Um, so you know, they hopefully will be in the hospital at the time of delivery and stuff like that. So again, you know, lungs, when they say underdeveloped, it's really the surfactant production is the problem that only starts to produce later in life for them. Okay, uh, their fat deposits, again, they're losing that, they don't have that brown fat, so they're, they have issues with insulation. Their um, hypothalamus, which is the part of their brain that is your thermostat, is not really fully developed yet, so they have a problem controlling temperature. They don't have a lot of glycogen. So glycogen is your storage form of sugar that you use for energy bursts and stuff like that. And then the last thing why it's always very important to um, cradle the baby and support the baby is that, you know, babies whose head is bounced around and, you know, they, you know, it has shaken baby syndrome when the parents are abusive. But when a baby sh shook around, their small, small, small arterioles tend to uh, tear and they have bleeding inside their brain. 
So just some pictures looking at, you know, the one all the way to the left is a preterm baby with low birth weight. The, one, the other one is a full-term baby who has low birth weight, okay? And then the other one is your normal little linebacker type of uh, child, okay? So that's just some, you know, I guess for reference purposes and stuff like that. Now we're going to go into some things and, uh, you know, we're, we're almost towards the end. Just some things that could go wrong, okay, on babies and stuff like that. So coenal anesthesia and stuff like that is where they're, they're born, where their nasal passageways are blocked. And we already said that the problem is that babies choose to breathe through their nose. So if their nasal passageways are blocked and they choose to breathe through their nose, they have big issues. Okay, so those babies typically need to be intubated. Okay, cleft lip, cleft palate, I'll show you pictures there. Again, they have airway uh, problems um, as far as, you know, keeping their airway open and stuff like that. Okay, a baby would, uh, well, actually, i just show you some pictures here and then we'll go on with it. Okay, so this is a cleft lip. Okay, so it's just going to be, you know, an airway issue, a cleft palate. Okay, um, so here's a normal nasopharynx. This is your, your turbinates. Here's your nose. So this is your nasopharynx. This is your oropharynx, your mouth. Here's your tongue, right? These little things here, your turbinates, when the air comes in, it bounces off of them to kind of stir up the air so you get rid of all the particles. Somebody has coenal atresia, they have a bone, okay, that grew over here. It's an anatomical defect, so they can't breathe through their nose. So they only have their mouth to breathe through. And again, they preferentially choose to breathe through their nose, so these babies definitely have problems. Um, it's a surgical fix, okay, and, you know, the baby will be fine. But um, until that point, a lot of times they're just prophylactically um, intubated to maintain an airway. A diaphragmatic hernia means that, so you know your diaphragm is your bell-shaped muscle that's right over here, right? So a diaphragmatic hernia, um, the only time I've actually seen it is in adults who are stabbed up through their, um, their diaphragm. But what happens is your intestine prolapses through the hole up into your chest. Now, it usually doesn't happen on the right side because your liver is a large organ on your right side and it protects it and doesn't let it happen. Um, maybe you can lacerate your liver, obviously, but this kid is born with this. This is not a traumatic event. But I'm talking somebody who shot or stabbed, it can, you know, obviously stops them from having a diaphragmatic hernia, but you, you can bleed to death from a liver laceration. But anyway, in this case, they have an anatomical defect uh, where they have a hole in their diaphragm and their intestine, you can see it all up in here, has come up into their, actually, this is their stomach, has come up into their thorax. So that means they, have collapsed their lung on this side because they can't expand it because of their um, stomach being up there. So these kids would have significant respiratory distress. You'd have absent breath sounds on that side. So somebody who doesn't even know that this exists might think the kid has a pneumothorax and God forbid stick a needle in there and now, you know, have the secretions, the essence of the stomach leak into the chest and, you know, probably kill the kid. Um, but these kids need to be intubated, they need to be ventilated with higher pressures, and they need to have a surgical fix to bring the stomach back down through the diaphragm and then have the diaphragm um, sealed. Okay, so that's, you know, so if you have that issue, most of the times they'll pick this up with the ultrasounds and the sonograms, so they'll know in advance what's going on. And again, either they'll fix it in utero or, you know, they'll, they will uh, have that baby in way early, do a C-section and whisk that baby right off to surgery. Okay, um, some other very strange things, and I'm only showing you this, just God forbid, and again, in our area with good prenatal care, these parents are gonna know that this exists, and this is gonna, these kids are gonna be in the hospital, the parents are gonna be in the hospital, we're never gonna see this or anything like that. Um, but, you know, just in case, you know, that one in a million, maybe it's a, a young girl who doesn't want anybody to know she's pregnant and is wearing, you know, big bulky sweaters and stuff. So nobody notices she's pregnant and stuff. So this gastrosis is basically where, okay, the, oops, I'm sorry. You're going to see the, and it could be anything. It could be the stomach, it could be the intestine, but basically extruding through the wall of the abdomen. Okay. So it looks like an evisceration. It's non-traumatic. It's just a defect, okay, in the, the abdominal wall and everything comes through. So just like you would have done with an evisceration, you're going to cover it with a cool, moist, um, well, I should say a moist dressing. It doesn't have to be cool, but a moist dressing, okay? And then if you could take anything um, that would act kind of as a temperature block, like a piece of plastic wrap or whatever, anything you might have, um, even if it's got to be like a multi-trauma dressing or something, but just kind of put the moist dressing over it and then put that other dressing on top of it because they're going to lose a lot of heat through that opening. Um, you know, so you just, just prevent hypothermia and stuff like that. This uh, other situation, okay, is this um, omphalocele is where the abdominal um, 
organs are actually encased in a sack, I guess is the best way to describe it. Now, it doesn't have to be every single, it could be like an intest piece of intestine, it could be the stomach, it could be the liver, you know, or spleen or something, but it's encased in a sack and it's on the outside of the body, okay? So in that case, uh, you know, it's not the same concerns of drying out and the same concerns of temperature maintenance. I would still cover it, um, but, you know, you don't have to worry about the moist dressing. You don't have to worry about temperature loss or anything like that. Okay. Um, so just, again, some pictures of the two, you know, so here it's in the sac, right? And this is the gastrosis where the intestine on the outside. Okay. And fortunately, you're talking, you know, minuscule times it happens. You know, if you were in a third world country, it'd be probably more and stuff like that. Okay, this myomeningeal seal is where part of the, um, the meninges of the spine, okay, actually protrude outside, okay? Um, so it's kind of the, you know, you know, when you have the meninges, you have the dura matter and the pia matter, all those different layers. So it's kind of protruding on the outside. Uh, nothing really to do for the kids. If it's up high in the cervical area, it may interfere with positioning and stuff uh, of the airway, but um, you know, that's it. If it's open, then again, I would just put a, you know, a, a moist sterile dressing over it and then a dry dressing over that just for an infection disease type of standpoint, like this one over here on the right, okay, where it's open and stuff. Um, again, it's a surgical fix. Um, I don't know long-term prognosis or anything like that. Now, this one I wanted to show you. Uh, each, each TCosis is where it looks like the child suffered a burn. So could you imagine this baby's delivered? Maybe you get there and the baby's already out and immediately it's going to scream to people child abuse and stuff like that. So the first time I saw a baby born, okay, and I saw the Vernax, I thought it was this because, you know, I, I read a little more during EMT class and stuff like that. Um, but it is not a, um, it's not a burn. It's a genetic disorder of the skin. And it looks like the skin is kind of uh, sloughing off, like flaking, breaking off and stuff like that. I don't know, again, what the long-term prognosis of the kid is or anything like that, but it is not any abuse or anything like that, okay? There is a little risk, increased risk of heat loss, okay, and fluid loss through it and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I would not, in this case, wrap the child in a moist sterile dressing because that would just make them colder, but I would make sure that they are wrapped so that you don't have to worry about, um, you know, any more heat loss and stuff like that. Okay, so that's everything I had for tonight, and it is storming out now. So does anybody have any questions on anything that we went over tonight? You can unmute yourselves if you do. Okay. If not, um, I'm pretty much done. I don't know how, how long do we go. 8.50, almost 9. We start at 7.30, so I'm still under an hour and a half. Okay, so any questions, any comments, any suggestions, how to do it better? You could always email me or let Pete know or Wayne know or anybody know. Okay, if not, everybody have a good night. Stay safe. And uh, I'll try to get the test out uh, shortly. And um, I'm going to send a link to Pete, and Pete will send it out to everybody else. Okay? Any problems on the test, just let me know. Everybody have a good night. Okay. Thank have you. A, have Thank a great you. night. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Right. Stay safe. Thanks, Frank. Bye. No problem.